Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I have Rich Lewis here today and he is an author and a speaker and a coach who focuses on centering prayer as a means of inner transformation. Welcome to the show, Rich. Great. No, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so we were just talking about Rich being from the Philadelphia area, which I'm kind of envious because I love the terminal market in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right. <laughs> That's my favorite place. And the food's great there, too. So tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background and, um, you know, tell us what Centering Prayer is. Sure. Well, I, I have a site called um, Silence Teaches Us Who We Are. Um, the, the website is silenceteaches.com. And I, it was created back in 2014. And it's as a result of me discovering the center in prayer practice. So back in, well, even way, even before that, so prior to 2014, and, just, and I'll talk about how I discovered Center in Prayer, but prior to that, I had read books by Carl McCollum, and he talked a lot about how powerful and transforming silence was. And this was, I think, in like 2011, 2012. I don't remember him talking about a practice. So at that time, I would just simply try silence and sit in it for a minute or two minutes or three minutes. And I remember it being brutal and <laughs> difficult, but I kind of persisted and I didn't really know what I was doing. And then in late 2013, I was simply perusing Amazon looking for a book to read. And I came across a book by Amos Smith called Healing the Divide, Recovering Christianity's Mystic Roots. And as I began reading this book, um, he talked about a practice called centering prayer that he had been doing for about 15 years up until that point. And it was silent meditation, wordless prayer. So that immediately intrigued me. So I you know, emailed him on his website and he responded back to me and we began a back and forth dialogue. And I also began practicing it for, for myself. Um, and then in I decided to jump in the center, I'll call it jump in the center in prayer swimming pool and try it twice a day for 20 minutes as much as possible, because that's what the, the people that had started centering prayer back in the early 1970s thought you get the most benefit from it if you have a twice a day practice and try to practice twice a day for 20 minutes. So that's, that's how I discovered centering prayer was simply, um, I had been attracted to the silence, I knew it was powerful, but I didn't know what to do in it. Then I discovered a practice of what you have, how you can sit in silence and centering prayer. And we can talk about how you do it really resonated with me and has stayed with me. And I've been practicing it um, since uh, 20, you know, June of 2014 on a consistent daily basis. Yeah, so how do you, so what, how do you do practice centering prayer? I mean, how do you sit in silence? Cause a lot of people struggle with that. Sure. So, um, you know, first, maybe I'll just give a quick history, and then I'll describe how you do Centering Prayer. So, as I mentioned, Centering Prayer was created in the early 1970s by actually three Trappist monks. So, three Catholic priests at that time saw that other forms of meditation were happening, and they wanted something for the Christian community. And, and one of them, Father William Manager, was reading a 14th century book called The Cloud of Unknowing. And as he read this book, kind of a method of silent prayer jumped out of the pages as, as he read it. And he and the other priests began um, practicing it. And I'll, and I'll share how you do it. And began practicing amongst themselves, amongst other clergy, amongst lay people, and then really with the intention of rolling it out to, to everybody, because it's not something that was just, just for clergy. Anybody could practice it and, and benefit from it. And then about 10 years later in 1984, um, Thomas Keating, one of the Trappist monks, created the Contemplative Outreach Organization, which really is the main centering prayer organization. So they have a website called contemplativeoutreach.org. And on the site is, are a ton of centering prayer resources, groups that practice throughout the US as well as internationally. And, and events are listed if you want to attend an online event or a live, a live event. So it's about a 50 year old practice. And, uh, and I'll pause for a minute before I describe it, but I'll pause there just if you wanted to react to any of that so far. What? No, keep going. <laughs> so 
<laughs> and that's funny. We were chatting beforehand. Some people just keep talking. Some people uh, yeah, allow interactions. Yeah, some people keep talking and they don't give you a chance to jump in. I don't mind interrupting if I have something burn, like a burning question, but keep going. I do have some questions, sure, but sure. I want you to get through your, your description first. Sure. So centering prayer is considered two things. It's considered meditation, but it's also considered a relationship with God, because during centering prayer, we believe we're opening to the presence and actions of God within. So we don't think we're God, but we think God is within us and we're connecting to uh, the divine within us during this silent sit time. So how you do the practice is you sit comfortably with your eyes closed to begin your practice, you introduce this, what we call a sacred word, and it's usually one or two or three syllables. So it could be love, ocean, beach, a color, God, Jesus, faith. You introduce that word interiorly, signifying your sitting and your opening to the presence and actions of God within. And then as you're sitting there, when you begin engaging your thoughts, and what I mean by that is if you're, you begin thinking about all the things you did before your sit, or you begin thinking about errands you need to do after your sit or projects you need to do after your sit, you realize you're no longer sitting with your with God and the present moment. You're sitting with you and you're planning and plotting. So then you reintroduce that sacred word to come back to the present moment and the purpose of your sit and, le and let go of your engaged thoughts and then even let go of the sacred word. So you really just use that sacred word when needed to bring yourself back to the present moment. And you do that during the duration of your sit, whether you've chosen to sit five minutes or 10 minutes or, or 20 minutes. And the last thing I'll say is you don't have to use a word. I, some people use a word if they're auditory people. I realized soon thereafter, as I began practicing centering prayer, I'm more of a visual person. So I use an interior image to bring myself back. Some people use their breath and others don't close their eyes because they worry they'll fall asleep. So they keep their eyes open and just stare at a spot five or six feet, perhaps on the floor as just to keep themselves in the present moment. So that's, I guess, a quick history of, of centering prayer, how long it's been around, when it was created, and, and how, how you do it. Mm -hmm. So I always say to people who fall asleep meditating, they're sleep deprived. So I always recommend you need to get more sleep. <laughs> You know, or, you know, it could be a block, some kind of block to meditation, some kind of fear, or, you know, or maybe they're not used to relaxing. And when they relax, they just fall asleep. But um, I think that's interesting because everybody has different talents, right? So there are different senses that we're more attuned to so like we're more visual some people more visual some are more auditory what about if it, if you are more of a feeling person um is there a feeling maybe you could use a word that would invoke a feeling you you could so if, if you if you so you're referring to your emotions so not feelings as in touch or physical but more of a you you could then you might want to choose a word that makes sense for you. But what you, the only thing you want to be careful of is you don't want to be honing in and focusing on that word or, or yeah. that feeling. It's really just to bring you back to the present moment. And then you let go of your, you even let go of that. So you, you, you're letting go of your engaged thoughts. You're using this word or whatever method you're choosing to come back to the present moment. But then you're letting go of that method too, because the purpose is just to completely open to the presence and actions of God and let go of you and all your planning and plotting. So right. as long as the feeling isn't something, then you sit there and, and focus on for the duration of your sit, then it's probably right. not the right. But if you if it's if it's effective and just lets you come back to the present and let go of your engaged thoughts, then yes, that, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So now you've been practicing this for, you know, a while now. So how long are you doing the centering prayer for? Sure. I sit um, and it varies. So sometimes I sit twice a day and sometimes I sit three times a day. So my first sit is usually is, is not usually is always first thing I do as I get up in the morning, no matter what day it is. And as much as possible, I take 20 minutes to do that sit. And then my second sit, and it varies. So like right now, I've been, I've been working from home um, for the last two years, and actually now it's going to continue. So it's going to be forever. And work's been very hectic and busy. 
And I found that I really need a third sit just to help me get through the day. But I shorten mm -hmm. the sit. So I have a second sit at around one o'clock in the afternoon. And it's anywhere from seven to 10 minutes. And then about two or three hours later, perhaps at three o'clock to 3.30 in the afternoon, I take a third sit from seven mm -hmm. to 10 minutes. And I'm finding I really need it. So some people will say, you know, what, do you, what are you doing that for? You know, you need to work. You need to focus on your tasks. And what I found is that it, it helps me get through the day, taking these silent breaks, you know, at one and then another one at three or so helps me get through the day. And it helps me let go of anxiety and worry and stress and things I don't need to focus on so I can hone in and focus on what I need to. So I'm always pleased when I look back at the end of the day that I, it helped me get through the day rather than saying, you know what, I'm going to skip that second sit because I'm too busy. I'm finding that I need that second or third sit. And, and, it, and I did, a couple of years back, I did the same thing. Work got really busy and I shipped it to three sits. It calmed down and I went back to two sits. And then about two months ago, I shifted back to the three sits and I've kept it there. And I'm going to keep it there until I feel that I, that it, I can shift it. And if it has to stay this way for a while, then, then it will. <laughs> yeah, I don't under understand the mentality of not taking a break. I mean, we're not machines, you right. know, we, well, maybe machines need breaks too, but, you know, we're people and we, we need to take breaks and it's this whole go, go, go mentality is exhausting. And that's why people are burnt out and exhausted. So when you're sitting, what's happening? Are you, so you're completely devoid of thought. Right. So a lot of things are happening. Um, um, First, our bodies hold a ton of tension and, and everybody holds tension in multiple places, whether it's your forehead or your shoulders or your stomach or, or your chest. So we're releasing tension every time we sit and meditate we're releasing tension that our body holds. So that's pretty powerful. You think about sitting daily, weekly, monthly, over a number of years, you're releasing stress from your body. You're letting go of thoughts, as I said, because we're continuously coming back to the present moment and, and letting go of thoughts that are harmful to us or, or things such as, you know, I'm not confident enough or I'm worried or I'm anxious or I'm the wrong person for this task. We're letting go of all of these thoughts we tell ourselves that um, we don't need to tell ourselves and they're really not true. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, also what's, what can happen is we let go of repressed thoughts. So things we didn't know we had buried start coming up and out. And sometimes that can be scary, but that, that is a healthy thing because we're holding on to these repressed thoughts that we didn't know we had and we're letting them out. So during this time, that, that it, it's kind of a nice healing is happening of tension and emotional tension and repressed thoughts. So it, it's, it's really freeing us from holding on to all of this tension and stress that we don't need to so that we can be free just to we, it's more it's freeing and we were more free to act and move and on our daily life rather than acting with all of this in our bodies and in our minds and in our hearts yeah can you give an example of what would be like a repressed thought that comes in and how do you deal with that while you're sitting i mean i guess a repressed thought could be a, a memory from childhood that Maybe you have, you have a, a terrible memory of, of, of either trauma you've experienced that you've repressed because it was too painful or um, someone close to you passed, passed away or some type of event happened to you, whether, whether, you uh, whether it was a car accident or whether an injury. So a, a lot of times we will repress these, this trauma of, of uh, someone's death or, or trauma of some incident that occurred in our life. So um, it can start coming out and, and it is scary, but, it, but in, 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 it's much needed to be dealt with. Um, it, needs, it needs to come out and we need to heal ourselves of it because we don't need to carry ourselves with it. And I guess in some cases, depending upon the trauma, um, you may want to seek a professional, whether it's a, a, a psychiatrist or, or a psychologist, if it's that traumatic and it keeps coming up and it's too painful, you can continue practicing centering prayer, but maybe it's not a bad idea to seek a professional just to help you um, deal with it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
since this is the weirdest experience, have you ever had anything come up that was unusable or did you ever hear or see or feel anything while you were sitting and centering prayer that you were like, hmm, that's odd or because meditation could be the gateway to your psychic senses and, um, you know, your more psychic ability. So has that ever happened to you? Not during centering prayer, but outside of centering prayer. And, and, I, and I wrote about these in, in my book, Sitting with God. I had um, two experiences that I can't explain other than they happened. And I'm assuming they happened just because as I continue practicing centering prayer, you just open yourself up to life and, mm -hmm. and hearing and seeing things. So I remember back, I think this was back in 2016, I was traveling to New York City for work. I remember getting up there the day before on Sunday before a Monday meeting. And I remember walking, I think it was in Union Park, and then I was sitting in, in Union Park, just enjoying myself. And then all of a sudden, and, and sit, New York City is loud to begin with, but I don't think it had anything to do with the, with the sounds of New York City. It's, everything was loud and vibrant, and I felt like life was just pulling me and it was mm -hmm. almost overwhelming and I wanted it to stop and I didn't know what was going on and it's hard to explain what happened because I knew yes because I'm sitting there thinking this is overwhelming I know New York City is loud but this is more than just the typical loudness of New York City I feel like life is coming at me I can heal it hear it feel it and it's just overwhelming and, and, I, and I needed to stop. And then after about 10 minutes, it stopped. And I remember calling um, Amos, who, who I mentioned earlier, because we we've become friends since I read his book and we worked together. Mm -hmm. I remember calling him to say, I'm, I'm just, and telling him I had this experience and anyone else might've thought I was nuts. And, and he didn't think I was nuts. So that was one thing I, I, I do remember happening. And that was back in 2016. And then it stopped after about 10 minutes. And I've never had that type of experience. And then a couple of years later, I was simply in, in a, we live in a cul de our house is in a cul-de-sac and I was outside in the cul-de-sac with two of my children and my son Joshua was um, riding his bike in the cul-de-sac and I was watching him and my daughter and I were just throwing a tennis ball back and forth. And then all of a sudden it, it got super bright and was just bright, but I could still see, but it was overwhelmingly bright, but I didn't feel like I was going to, like I, I've, if you're dehydrated, all of a sudden you can faint, and pass out. Well, I was I was hydrated and I did not feel like I was going to pass out and I wasn't sweating profusely, but it was super bright for about a 10 minute period. And I and I just continued to play and watch them. And I'm like, I didn't know what was going on. And I'm, you know, I get scared to tell people this, but it, but it was so that was another thing that happened where it wasn't loud and pump life pummeling me, but it was just a brightness but I knew I was okay. And I knew I wasn't going to, so that one was different. I didn't feel like, okay, this needs to stop. It was just like, what's going on here, but I'm, I'm okay. It's just, things are super bright, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I know I'm not going to pass out. I feel fine. <laughs> so it, was it like a brightness where, you know, somebody turned a light on and every, all the colors lit up or it was more of a yellow. So that one I do remember. It was more of a, it was more of a, a yellow, like a like a bright yellow, like the sun was just blasting away. Mm -hmm. and so so no, I wasn't seeing beautiful colors and rainbows. It was more of just everything was gl a glowing yellow, not quite a gold, but everything was just kind of glowing, a, a yellow gl glow. Yeah, that reminds me of one of my favorite books. Have you ever read Celestine Prophecy? I have not. I have not. So he describes in the book how about energy. It's a really good book about energy. So I recommend okay. it a lot to my Reiki one students. Okay. But he he says if you see it, if you're in a forest and there's a two there's a fork in the forest, focus on on the two pathways and which one will light up more for you, and that's the path you should choose. So that, that's what it kind of reminds me of. Oh, is, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And probably the centering prayer is making you more sensitive to noise because, you know, you're sitting in silence now. But I'm actually like that a lot. Like imagine being like that all the time, how you oh, reacted okay. to the city. And okay. I think sensitive and empathic people are like that. It just becomes overwhelming. So we'll avoid like, crowds and noise and or if we're in a noisy place like an amusement park it really is so exhausting 
and draining to be like that because you're not able to shut it out as well as other people i think right no that no that makes sense because i think yeah. about my 10 minute experience and for you if it's if it's something you would frequently experience i can't even it, it would be tiring and you're, you're like shut it off <laughs> yeah yeah like recently i went through this phase where i just didn't want to be around people like i only wanted to be around my friends my close friends and my family and everybody else i just don't it's almost like i didn't want to deal with their energy you know so i was getting invited out and stuff but they were like july 4th you know some crazy firework show and I was like I do not want to do that right now <laughs> that doesn't feel fun to me no that, that, that makes sense I mean either the events or even everybody's different and it and has a different level of energy that you can experience <laughs> from people <laughs> whether it's warm or, or cold or on fire or or full of thoughts you're right everybody emits energy in one way or another, whether it's positive or negative or neutral. <laughs> and a lot of people are just blasting stuff because right. they're, they're not aware, you know, they lack awareness and they lack discipline and they're, they're just all over the place. And so, you know, sensitive people, they feel that, you know, right. they feel other people's feelings. So, and same for me. If I'm feeling very strongly, I know my whole family feels it. You know. Neat. That's very, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So you wrote a book about it, and um, tell us a little bit more about what you wrote in the book. What's the book about? Sure. The book's called "Sitting with God: A Journey to Your True Self Through Centering Prayer." And the gentleman, Amos Smith, was the one that nudged me to write the book back in um, 2014. He had, I was, I had started working with him off of his site, and we just, you know, created a nice friendship. And he was the one that challenged me and, and said, you know, I think you have something important to, to say. Okay. My book was a little bit more academic, and at the time, he's he's not now, but he had been a United Church of Christ pastor for a good 20 years or so, and he thought it'd be neat for me to write from my perspective as a lay person because he was coming from as a pastor and, and, and studying the Bible and more of an academic book as well. So he challenged me to write a book at the time. And at the time I thought he was crazy because I had never written anything more than a, <laughs> five or six pages in college. I didn't have to write a ton. And I thought, like, can, how can, how can I write a book? I mean, so I, I said, how, how do I do this? And he said, well, just think of single sentence statements of, of about centering prayer and what it means to you. And just, just, whatever comes to mind. So I took a week or two to do that and sent him back an email with like 13 statements. And he said, there's your chapters, go write. Well, I thought, well, that's <laughs> that sound as easy as that. So I figured I picked one of them this, and I wrote a chapter over a week or two weeks and sent it back to him just to see what he thought. And mm -hmm. then I figured if he thought this is, if he thought, you know, this is crazy and this guy doesn't know how to write, then I would just end it there. But to my surprise, he, he liked it found it intriguing and interesting and a neat perspective and said, you really need to just continue. And then it dawned on me that maybe I can write a book. So I asked my wife, so what do you think of me writing a book? Because we had you know, three kids at the time and I didn't want to take time away from them. And she said, no, I think you should. So I, I decided to write it on Saturday morning. So I got up at 6 a.m. on Saturday mornings. This was all pre-COVID and wrote in the local Starbucks from about 6 to 9 or 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings. And that's when most of the book got written and and the so the book itself really is is um as, as i said it's called sitting with god a journey to your true self through centering prayer so it talks about you know obviously what is centering prayer it talks about how it has healed and transformed me you know i, I share stories of how, how it how it has helped me and, and the fruits of the practice throughout the book and it, and it also helps people that are existing practitioners because i talk about how to deepen your practice and, and go deeper into God and deeper into your true self and, and who is this person. So that's really what the book is about is what is centering prayer, share how it has healed and transformed me. And that I can, and, and that I can do the same for you and that it might be a practice that resonates with you. So to, to try it and see if it, if it will help you as it has helped me. Yeah. So how has it transformed you? Sure. When I, look back and I kind of compare the rich prior to center prayer and then the rich after centering prayer, a lot of neat, a lot of neat things. One, 
a lot more confidence in myself. I'm, I'm much more confident in, in how I act in life, whether it's with my family or whether it's with my day job or whether it's with um, my one-on-one -on -one coaching or even the confidence to, to jump on a podcast. I would have been terrified to do this back in 2013 and earlier. I would have been terrified to speak in front of small and large groups. And now that, that excites me. So a ton of confidence. Um, Another fruit is just an ex not that I was depressed, but a kind of an excitement for life and what's today going to bring me and what, what, what am I going to experience today? So an excitement for life and a curiosity for life and a willingness to get out of my comfort zone and try and do new things as a result of centering prayer. I would say more patience. Sometimes everybody, we want something immediately. And sometimes if you're patient, it comes. Or sometimes if you're patient, you realize, you know what, what I wanted doesn't make any sense. And here's a different door that I should open and, and, and go through. So that's so why I've learned patience. And then I think also less reactive. I'm more willing to listen to people and not immediately be critical and judge them, mm -hmm. but just listen to what they have to say and respect it. And then maybe even realize, you know what, that actually does make sense. And, and I never thought of it that way. So some of those fruits are, are some really neat fruits that I've experienced. Yeah. I noticed that in myself too, that, I used to react a lot faster and now I choose to not react right away and you stay calmer that way. You know, you're able to think clearly if you don't react emotionally to everything. Um, so yeah, I was about to ask you about the reaction as well, but that sounds really good. It sounds like a lot of us need to practice that. And I can also relate to not wanting to speak in front of people because as a, even, I don't know if you were this way, but even as a child, I never wanted to speak in front of groups. So even though I knew the answer <laughs> in class, I wouldn't raise my hand and my teachers would over and over again, give feedback on the report card and say, Tina's a really good student, but she, you know, she needs to speak up more in class. Well, I never like to do that. I never like to do that. So when I started teaching Reiki, I used to be so nervous and I would sweat and, you know, but with practice, every, it gets easier, right? That's why I always, you don't underestimate the power of practice. So if you keep practicing, you'll get more comfortable with it. No, I mean, that's just so true. We just need to kind of nudge ourselves to get out of our comfort zone. But yes, so like I've been on over 100 podcasts, so I, I get better and better as I keep doing these podcasts. But in the beginning, I was nervous. And I thought, what if they ask me a question I can't answer? Um, or how am I gonna, going to sound? Or am I going to ramble and not give them a chance to talk as well? Because I remember in the very beginning, I would listen to some of them and I thought, Oh my God, I, I, I need to shut up and let the other person talk. I'm just going on and on and on where I'm cutting them off. So you get better as, as you practice, you'll learn to get more comfortable and you don't need, like, I, I, you just, you, you trust your instinct. So now I just trust my instinct where I don't worry. I just go on and whatever I get asked, the answer will come. It right. just will, like, I just trust it, it will come. And even when I give some talks, you got to, some of it's prepared. And then sometimes you, you go, you go off script and, and you have to go off script because that's where, that's where it goes. And so I've just learned to just trust, trust the moment and trust my instinct and that it's within me and what I need to say will come out. Yeah. And the beauty of it is, is you're talking about something that you know really well. So you don't really need to prepare for it, you that's know? True. You know, like there's certain topics that we're comfortable talking about. Yours is centering prayer and mine is like, you know, Reiki or energy or healing or, you know, I could talk about that all day long. I don't need a script for it, you know. So it's it's that confidence you have in, in the subject matter that you're expert in, right? No, I mean, that's so true. And a personal friend of mine was just so funny. He's like, you know, I tell them I do podcasts and some of them are 20 minutes, some are 30 minutes, some are hour. I said, I've done a few that are 90 minutes. He's like, what can you possibly talk about? And I said, it gets filled. So he was like, how can you talk about centering prayer for 90 minutes? And I said, I just did. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not hard. Yeah. 
<laughs> and you probably yeah. find the same thing with, with, you know, with what you love to do. <laughs> right. And like, we can't plan everything out and who would want to, because I feel like whatever comes up, comes up for a reason. So even though we may not be talking about centering prayers straight for 40 minutes so far, you know, we're talking about related topics and it's something that you and I need to hear and whoever is listening needs to hear it as well. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more of like divine timing or, you know, if when I'm teaching a class, I let my students talk a lot. And sometimes that could be a problem because I'm, you know, running out of time to, to teach what I need to teach, but I feel like they need to say what they need to say. And that the people that showed up for that class needed to meet each other and hear each other on that very day. That's true. I mean, that, that really is so true. And that, that becomes what what needed to happen that day. So a lot of times what you thought and then what actually happened or, or a little bit apart, <laughs> but yeah. then that's okay. And that's okay. What, what happened is, was much needed. Right. Right. The questions that were asked needed to be asked in front of this certain group of people. Right. Yeah. So tell us how we can get a copy of your book and if anybody would re reach out to you or had any questions, how can they find you, Rich? Sure. Uh, the best place to find me is my website, silenceteaches.com. When they come there, uh, when they subscribe, they'll get my free ebook on Centering Prayer, which is just a very short booklet that, that they, they can read in, in five or ten, five minutes or so, if just to share what Centering Prayer is. And then if they are further interested, my book is on my website um, and it's available at um, Amazon and, and really most online best uh, online booksellers, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart, uh, a ton, a ton of booksellers, as well as uh, overseas and on various sites if, you, if you're internationally as well. So mm -hmm. silenceteaches.com is the best place to find me, learn a little bit more about Centering Prayer. And then if you really are more curious, my book is, is on my website as well. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for sharing your experience and um, with the listeners and, you know, definitely all his information is going to be in the notes. So if you want to reach out, find the book and reach out to Rich, it, all that information will be in the notes for the show. No, thanks for having me on. And I hope this was something uh, very helpful for your community. All right. Thank you, Rich. Thank you.